are scattered abroad. That's to say the 12 tribes, the 10 tribes scattered abroad. Being very specific in your freedom of Christianity, the repentance, uh, giving much personal instruction as far as controlling our thoughts and finding peace and giving us those parameters wherein Christianity Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to this Bible study hour. Back in our Father's Word, the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 2 today. You know, this chapter 2, if you've ever wondered why Christ died on the cross, did it for us, did it for you. But this chapter 2 lets you know also the base reason of why he did it. Therefore, it makes it a very interesting chapter. We'll, we'll, I'll explain as we get there. We're going to pick it up and chat with uh, chapter 2, verse 5. As he speaks of his son, that's our father speaking of the son, which is to say, Emmanuel, God with us. And we continue then, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 5, it reads, um, with that word of wisdom from our father. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come whereof we speak. But the Lord Jesus Christ, he did. He put it, put it under his feet. Who's going to put it under his feet? God's election are. He's going to stay on the throne of God until that takes place through the Holy Spirit, through the power from on high. Verse 6, but one in a certain place testified, saying, well, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visiteth him? Who, who said that? Well, David did. And, and you'll find it in, in uh, Psalms chapter 8, and we'll find it verse 4. Uh, you're not going to have it, but I'm going to read it for you. If you wish to follow, I'll say it again. Psalms 8, verse 4. Who, who wrote it? David. Listen carefully. What is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visitest him. Verse 5. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and has crowned him with glory and honor. Verse 6, Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. No, he didn't do that for some angel, but he did that for Emmanuel, God with us, uh, always in control. You know, th this alleviates you from a lot of anxiety in these end times about how troubles pile up and it would seem that things are impossible. They're not. He's still on the throne. It's going, he, he always keeps his hand over his election. It, it may get a little rough sledding sometimes, but he knows you're a can-do type person. He knows you can cut it. Why? Because he chose you. What is man? He knows what man is. Man, if he so chooses and designates, accomplishes what it is that God would have him accomplish. So with that, as he continues, let's return to chapter 2, the great book of um, Hebrews. And uh, after quoting that, and we'll pick it up again with the quote, David speaking, verse 7, Thou madest him a little lower than the angels, Thou crownedest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. That glory and that honor makes him worthy. 
to bring forth the salvation that is yours for the taking. That is to say, I could probably better say yours for the believing. If you believe upon him, he has the ability, he's in control, and he can show you it through the way to eternal life. Uh, and what a precious thing that is. Um, and verse 8 as we continue. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. But it's a promise and it will come to pass. Even though all things are not under his feet, he's still in charge. Okay. Again, I, I want to reiterate again. This should alleviate a lot of anxiety from you in these end times when you know he's on the throne. All things have been put under his hand and he loves you. He, he has grace, glory, and honor because he wanted to provide that salvation for you on repentance the atonement, his blood, that made it possible. Why did he do it? Well, we're going to find out in a little bit and uh, how, how precious it is. But this is not something that you think, well, we look forward to the eternity. No, look forward to today. today. Today is the day that the Lord has made. He's on the throne. Everything is cool. You will have, you will have uh, the heathen, as we learned in chapter 2, raging, and uh, the infidels will rage, but God's still in control. When he's ready to put a damper on it, he can turn that damper down anytime he so chooses. And those of you that might not know what a damper is, that cools the heat, where it's not, not he, he can control it at any time. And that's what our Father does. Let's go with the next verse, please. Verse 9. But we see Jesus, that's Yeshua's Savior, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. Every man. You're man. There's no gender in this. Men, women, children. He did it for everyone that will. He tasted death for that purpose, that, um, that you could have and attain eternal life, that you could have protection over you, guaranteed for a believer. Now, this is why that you, you don't want to get all wimpy and shook up over every little thing. He's on the throne. You've got nothing to worry about other than fear itself. So just get rid of it. Uh, look, observe, and enjoy as the prophecies of the end times come to fulfillment and you're living in a generation where it happens. Even the prophets wish to live today when these things would come to pass. You do. So enjoy every moment of it and watch as God himself controls and brings things to pass as they are written. Verse 10 to continue. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect, that means mature, through sufferings. In other words, it, it took some suffering on his part. He paid a price, and that price pay, was your atonement when you believe that, um, uh, that his, his death on the cross 
his shedding of his blood, his dying once for all men, gives you the privilege, the opportunity, the pleasure of taking part in that honor, that glory that he is crowned with by the grace of God. That's God's love. God loves his children. God doesn't wake up every morning wanting to zap some child. They're his. But he does correct when they need to be corrected. And he um, is very disciplined. And if you want to get along with him, you will discipline yourself. Because a Christian without discipline is not really a Christian. And let's go with the next verse, verse 11. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified, he that does the saving and those that are saved, are all of one, for whose cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. He's not ashamed to call the least of us a brother or a sister. And that's why he paid the price. He didn't whimper. He didn't say, maybe we could put this off. He paid that price that, um, uh, that we could have that eternal life. And again, before we finish this chapter, you're going to know why it had to be this way. Let's go with verse 12. Verse 12, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. Do you know where he's quoting there? I'm not going to turn there. You're all familiar with it. It's Psalms 22, 22. Real easy to remember. Psalms 22, 22. And that's the psalm of the crucifixion. This is why Christ would say on the cross as he was giving up the ghost, Eli, Eli, lama shabbatane. In other words, quoting verse 1 of Psalms 22. That's what it is. He was not saying God forsook him. He was quoting David again, just as he had quoted David earlier in this same chapter where David was coming forth in prophecy with every word that would come from Christ's mouth while he was nailed on the cross and, uh, and, and Christ's teaching even as he was being crucified, even down to the Roman soldiers gambling for his clothing. It's written in Psalms 22. And even the words that would come from the fake high priest appointed by not God, but by a Roman governor, even his words would come forth a thousand years before the fact. Only God can bring something like that forth and have that many men, Roman soldiers gambling for the cloth, cloth, cloak, and the high priest saying the very words, and certainly the act of the crucifixion and what it was to accomplish. He said, I'm going to declare this in the church. I want it declared to the congregation so that they know and they understand. And, and uh, so it is that those that are saved will understand why. Now let's go with the next verse, verse 13. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. He's quoting, again, quite a lot of scripture here. Psalms 18, 2, and Isaiah 8, 18, and, and especially Isaiah 12, 2. But I, I, I want to take you uh, somewhere else. I want to take you to uh, John chapter 10, verse 27, what he has to say about the children. These are the words of Christ. John chapter 10, verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I don't have to hit them with a stick. I don't have to encourage them. They know my voice is true, and all I have to do is speak, and they follow. 
This is why when, when he was putting the disciples together, did he hold a revival? No. He simply said, follow me. And they followed. Verse 28. And I give unto them eternal life. And they shall never perish. Their souls are eternal. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Not Satan, not anyone else. You are as safe as, as possibly could be. That's why I told you you could alleviate a lot of the anxiety of the end times. If you really pay attention to this second chapter of the great book of Hebrews, no man can uh, separate you from the love of Almighty God and the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ, the chief shepherd. Verse 29, my father which gave them me is greater than all and no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. God himself having his hand upon the faithful, the followers, 30 to complete, I and my Father are one. And so it is that they are one. We covered that in the second Psalms, which we covered in the last lecture, along about verse 7. A lot of scripture quoted in this chapter. A lot of truth pouring forth. If, if you are in that sanctified position, both he that sanctifieth and the sanctified are God's children. It doesn't mind saying that's my brother and that's my sister. We're together eternally. And so it is. Well, why, why would God say, what is man? Well, man's his children. I don't care whether it's male, female, or what. You're God's children. And God's children, God loves. He created, why did God create his children? The last verse of chapter four, the great book of Revelation, God created all things for his pleasure. Because you pleasure him. Especially when you let him know that you love him. He has his hand upon you and no one, they may try, but no one can detour you from serving the living God. It is your destiny, it is your purpose. When you come to that place of understanding, verse 14 to continue, listen carefully. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same to show you he can do it. That through death, here comes your answer. That through death what? What did he accomplish? That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. So you, you have to remember here, the devil at one time is the king of Tyrus, which means the fake rock. He, he worked himself all the way up to a cherub that covereth the mercy seat. That, that has Messiah connotation of the very Christ seat himself, of salvation, of eternal life. And he had worked himself up to that. God said, I made you the full pattern. Why, well, he earned it. God doesn't give things away for free. And then he fell. You see, God, Satan is even a child of the living God. He created his very soul, his very being. And naturally, what does God want from his children? He wants their love. And the one thing that most people overlook, God cannot force someone to love him, or it's fake. God cannot buy love or it's fake. God cannot order love or it would be fake. Love must generate and, and originate within each entity, each child that brings that love forth outwardly and it returns to the Father. 
in Satan's case, even though he was a child of God, he went not only bad, but very bad, and drug a third of God's children off with him. And God, rather than destroying Satan at that time, and a third of the children destroyed the first earth age. I know that may sound a little deep. Put it on the shelf if you can't handle it right now. Because there was an earth age before this one. That's why that God could say to Jeremiah, I knew you before you entered your mother's womb. And this is why he could say to uh, Jacob and Esau, Jacob I loved and Esau I hated, before the, while they were still in the mother's womb, meaning from the first earth age. But he did this so he could destroy the devil, wickedness. Why? Well, what is going to happen to Satan? He's going into the lake of fire. He's going to die. He's going to perish. And why then did the crucifixion play into this? Because Satan and his henchmen were in that crowd that would yell, Crucify him! They brought about the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is to say, God with us, so God does not have to worry about snuffing him out. He's got it coming. He earned it the hard way, but he earned it. And this is why Christ came in the flesh, so that rightly so, Satan would have to pay with his very being and would be, we would be set free from the wickedness, the evilness in this earth, all things put under Christ's feet, whereby we would have eternal peace and calm at the doing away of Satan himself. Uh, this is the way God operates. He's not a respecter of persons. He does things fair for fair. When you got it coming, you can rest assured you're going to get it. Satan's got it coming, he's going to get it. He brought about the crucifixion, and he will pay with his eternal destiny. So then, returning to the 14th verse, for as much then, I'm sorry, we covered 14, 15, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. And, um, and, and this is what he did. He destroyed the devil and delivers people from the fear of death because death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? It has none. God destroys it with eternal life. You know, um, this... This really makes me wonder sometimes when I see people that kind of wimp out. They really get feeling sorry for themselves. He, he paid that price for you. He didn't whimper about it. He didn't complain. He paid it lovingly that you could have eternal life simply for asking sanctified by the sanctifier. I mean, it, the price is paid. It's yours for the taking. All you have to do is love him for what he accomplished for the whole family of God. Uh, and that is to say, in his service. Naturally, he had to defeat evil the hard way, and he did it by showing us how to get it done. Now, bear in mind, he is now on the mercy seat, the throne of God at the right hand of God, and he expects his election as they witness against the false one soon. What a time to live, to enjoy, fulfilling the very plan of God. And again, it would say, here, you're born in the flesh, and yes, the flesh can be painful. Oh, I mean, you can get bruised here and bruised there. He came in the flesh also. 
to show you how to get it done without a bunch of wimping out. To stand up and act like a man or a woman of God. That's, that's what he showed us the way. He got it done. And he got it done for us. He accomplished it for our, for the love of man, his brothers and his sisters. How precious it is. Let's go with the next verse, please. Verse 16. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels. I mean, he could have been supernatural, you understand? But he took on him the seed of Abraham. That is to say, what does Abraham mean in the Hebrew tongue? It means the father of many nations, those that would believe. And he took on that seed of the house of Judah and the house of Levi to be forever a priest after the order of Melchizedek and provided that way for us. Uh, he, could have, he could have come as, um, as Almighty God himself, but no, he came the only begotten flesh, born to woman, to show us it can be done because he accomplished it proudly, honorably, and in the grace of God, he paid the price. And that price is there for you, for eternal life, for the believing. Verse 17, wherefore in all things, it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people, to pay that price for them. It was, it was proper, he felt, for himself to do that, to make reconciliation. He did not mind paying that price for you. He did my, not mind at all accomplishing that whereby you could have eternal life Why? with him. And there being death destroyed at that time, what a, what a pleasure that's going to be. No, you know, a, a perfect body, not a flesh body, one that doesn't get old, one that doesn't get ill, that time means nothing to it. And so it is that time marches on. You know, all souls are the same age, basically, from the first earth age. And time has not bothered them. Why? Because time has no effect on those that have eternal life. Then let's go with verse 18 to complete the chapter. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to secure them that are tempted. This word secure is, means it's guaranteed. It's a down payment on your eternal salvation. It is nailed and he nailed it by shedding his own blood that you could have. Do you know what he's quoting here? He's quoting Isaiah chapter 49, uh, verse 8. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it to you. Isaiah chapter 49, verse 8. Thus saith the Lord, in an acceptable time have I heard thee, and in a day of salvation have I helped thee, and I will preserve thee and give thee for a covenant of the people to establish the earth to cause to inherit the desolate heritage that thou mayest say to the prisoners, go forth to them that are in darkness and show yourselves they shall feed in the ways, from the word of God, of course, and their pastures shall be in all high places. Um, 
they shall not hunger nor thirst. Neither shall the heat nor sun smite them. For he that hath mercy on them shall lead them, even by the springs of water shall he guide them. That, that's the promise. It's secured. It's nailed. Why? Because of God's love for those that follow him. God's love for those that, that love him. But notice it, there was a time and there is a place where salvation enters in. And naturally, when did salvation first enter in? When the price was paid on the cross. Salvation became available. This is why Christ would go all the way back um, in paradise to the time of Noah and the others to give them an opportunity to partake of the same salvation that you have an opportunity to partake of today. Why? Because God is not a respecter of persons. He treats all people the same, his children. So, and as you continue on, and you would find this written in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 and 19, if you continue on into the fourth chapter, while he was in paradise, he freed many, many souls. He let the captives go free. In other words, they accepted that salvation. So yes, there is a time of salvation. There is a time of visitation. And that time of visitation was when he paid that price for you, that he could call you brother, that he could call you sister. And he nailed it. It's there for you. It's secured. It's guaranteed. All you have to do is love him and accept. Don't miss the next lecture. Bless your hearts. Listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are. Back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you have a question, share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend or denomination or organization. We're not going to judge people. Why? We've got to judge. He's our Heavenly Father, and he, he doesn't appreciate it when you get on his toes because he is judge, you're not. You do have the right for spiritual discernment, which lets you know uh, and a, as a gift from God to be able to discern between truth and fiction. Truth is God's word. Fiction is the traditions of men. See that you're never deceived. Those of you that listen by shortwave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. And your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Again, always a pleasure. Got a prayer request. You don't need the number. We can do away with it. You don't need the address. Why? God knows what you're thinking. You don't even have to say it out loud. He's a cardio knower. He knows your very heart. And that's therefore to pray. You don't have to say it out loud. No one can prevent you from prayer, anytime, any place, because they won't know when you're praying. Your Father will. Always let Him know you love Him. That's what He wants most from you. Let's go to His throne, Father. Around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. 
Okay, and question time. We're going to go with Tim from Florida. Were there other people on earth when Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden? And the answer is yes. God created all the races on the sixth day. He, then he rested the seventh day. And then he created in the Hebrew manuscripts, Eth Ha'adam, which is to say the man Adam, through which Christ would be born. And through Christ would come salvation to all the peoples that replenished the earth. God is not a respecter of persons. And certainly, um, this is not a real popular teaching, but it is the truth. And the truth should be popular, whether it is or not. Uh, there is a reason that we have the different races of people. God looked. When you, when you read of the, about the completion, he made some fishers and some hunters, and, uh, and others, uh, their, um, their wheat grows from the water, that's rice, and, and um, the various people. He looked and it was good. He loves all of his children. Uh, Earl from South Carolina, what happens when Jesus comes back and his foot touches the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem? Will everybody be immediately changed into our glorified bodies or will there still be mortal who say, stay in the flesh bodies? And if so, what happens to the physical buildings and world order and so forth? It's a different dimension. But I, I must correct you a little bit. You say they still be mortal in flesh. There will still be mortal. Mortal in the Greek tongue means liable to die. But they will also be in spiritual bodies. Why? They've got to make it for a thousand years of, through, the, uh, through the millennium reign. It's called, how long is a day with the Lord? A thousand years. That's the millennium. And that's the Lord's day the true Lord's day as it is written in the great book of Revelation. It's a thousand years long. They will be in spiritual bodies, but they will still, some will still have a mortal soul, meaning liable to die. What? To perish in the lake of fire at the end of that thousand year period. Always know this, no one will die, or that is to say, the second death of the soul, and burn in a fire until after the great white throne judgment. Meaning, God's not going to send anybody to hell without judging them. Do they got to wait till that time? When does that happen? Revelation chapter 20 is the last day of that thousand year reign. Then, Many of them, there will be the second resurrection, meaning some will find salvation that had no chance or no opportunity during their flesh day. And they will take part in the second resurrection. Re again, Revelation 20. But those that do not will take part in the second death, which is the death of the soul. Uh, Kevin from California. How do we acquire our garments in heaven? And please give me the scripture to find what makes up our apparel. Revelation chapter 19, verse 8. You can find it first beginning or budding in Revelation chapter 3. But what does it say? It says his wife and the bride are both there. And they, their white linen is made from their righteous acts. So your righteous acts are you doing what is right, weaves together the fine linen you wear in heaven. Do you know what happens when you don't have any righteous acts? You don't have any linen. That can be embarrassing. Jerry from Virginia. If God created the Gentiles, then the flood came. How can they still be Gentiles? Well, what, what did he, who did he say to take aboard the ark? What did he say to Noah? He said, take two of every flesh. And it had already grieved him in verse 3 of chapter 6 in Genesis. 
that he had made man flesh also. So naturally the other races were in flesh and two of, of all of them had to go aboard that ark. Uh, and they, they lived through it. That's why we have different races today. There's no great mystery in God's hand uh, of, of creation. Mike from Tennessee, if God knows everything and is perfect, then he created Satan and Satan earned his way to the mercy seat, but then he wanted the mercy seat and rebelled against God and God knows everything and is perfect. Why did he not know this go was going to happen? Does that mean God is fallible? No, it doesn't. You know, it is so simple. Um, you could not understand love and make a statement like this. God wants his children to love him. And there's only one way love can be real, and that is to generate within each entity. So God has to give freedom to the entity to decide whether they will love him or not. And naturally, the reward for loving him is great. It's eternal life the reward for hating him or going against him is sure eternal death, meaning to be blotted out. But love has nothing to do with God's perfection. It rather has to do with your perfection, whether you truly love him or you play tricks or games, okay? So, um, God expects, Mark, it is his desire. You can, you can read it for yourself. Let me quote the scripture. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, or 8. It is God's will that all come to repentance. He, want, he wants all of his children to repent and have eternal life, but they're not going to. But that is his wish. That is his will, but it's not going to happen. And you might say, well, how could that be? Well, look around today. You've got some of the most mixed up, uh, absolutely people that could care less about God or even their own families or ways. When they're interviewed on the streets, it's like, duh. Well, what, what organization do you belong to? I, I go to this college right here. You know, they're well educated uh, in this college. It's a little liberal, but, okay. So, <clears throat> you know, you have to know and understand that God wants you to love him. If you don't, hey, bye. Sandy from Texas, can you tell me from the Bible where it says that the right things will seem wrong and the wrong shall seem right. Uh, one, of, one of the, probably uh, there is a better place, but the most important place where it says it is Daniel chapter 11, verse 32. Uh, what he does is when the Antichrist comes, that particular king, he covers and changes what is right by flatteries to do what is wrong, okay? He, by flatteries, he changes right from right to wrong. And certainly, um, uh, so it is. Glenn from Florida, thank you for your teaching. You're welcome. I'm finally learning the truth word of God. When I was baptized, I was completely submerged and done in the name of Jesus Christ. Is this acceptable to Yahweh our Father? Yes, it is. Why? Because what does Jesus Christ mean? Being interpreted. You were baptized in the name of Yahweh's Savior, Yeshua, the anointed one of the living God. Jesus uh, Christ is Christos, meaning the anointed one. And um, and certainly Jesus itself, Yeshua, means Yahweh's Savior. So a little, you know, people can do some of the strangest things by not understanding the languages that they uh, 
purport to utilize. Dan from Mississippi, I'm disabled and I wanted to know if I'm not able to work for the Lord if I give my testimony to everyone I get a chance to, am I still going to receive the same reward as those that do so much more? I would do more financially or physically, but I'm not able to. God bless you, hang in there. Well, we're, we're gonna do it, and we want you to hang in there too. You're doing just fine. You know, you're taking what you have to work with. You're a can-do type person. You're planting those seeds it is far more important to, to further the ministry in whatever way you can. Your way is planting seeds. More power to you. Okay, we got um, Lexi from, um, let's see, Pat Arnold Murray. I am, I'm just a kid, but I respect um, and I respect I respect and love uh, Jesus. I know they're the, God and the Jesus, they're the same person. I really, I feel, but I, I'm feeling scared and I know from fear comes from the devil, but something's making me, something's making me feel like he's not forgiving me, he doesn't love me, He's not with me, so can you help me? I, I sure can. I, I, want you to, I want you to make a note of Luke chapter 10, verse 19, where Christ gives you power and authority over even the devil in Christ's name. Gives you power over all your enemies. Spiritually speaking, you don't have to worry about a thing. And myself, I think you're a brave soul because you're honest and you're straightforward and you're, you're gonna do just fine. You don't have to worry about him forgiving you. When you repent, it's erased and he doesn't wanna hear about it again. So just, just know the only reason you can remember when you think you've done wrong is it is preservation of the body to keep you from doing it again, okay? But that doesn't mean Christ hasn't forgiven you. He certainly does. So, Lexi, you're doing real good. For 10, you hang tough. And uh, we, we love you, and God loves you too. Satan has no hold on you. Don't give him that uh, space. Okay, Cameron uh, from uh, Illinois, or Carmen, rather, from Illinois. Pastor Murray. I love your program. I got a question. When Jesus was here, those, pe those people die and God made more souls and are we the same souls and spirit? All souls and spirits were made at the same time in the first earth age. Each one must be born of woman through this earth age before the end can come. That's God's plan and that's how it is. He does not make more souls. So. Every soul has been exposed in the first earth age to life itself, and so it will in this earth age as he continues on. Uh, Judy from North Carolina, Pastor, please give me scripture on the unpardonable sin. The unpardonable sin is mentioned in more places than one as blaspheming the Holy Spirit. But where you really get the meat of what God is talking about is Luke chapter 12, verse 10. And, and what he tells you there, and, and it's only written, the unpardonable sin can only be committed by one of God's elect. That is to say one that knows the Antichrist comes first and knows from Mark chapter, the, the very chapter that uh, you're delivered up before the false one and the Holy Spirit must speak through you. You're not to premeditate what you'll say. Uh, Luke, you'll find 21 and, and uh, Matthew 24, same thing. It's to refuse the Holy Spirit the chance to speak through you. He lets you know that you can, you can refuse anything Christ said when he walked the earth. But when the Holy Spirit wants to speak through you, if you refuse, that's unpardonable. 
So the unpardonable sin is for one of God's elect to refuse the Holy Spirit to speak through them when they're delivered up before the Antichrist himself. I do not believe it can happen because I know God's election pretty well. I, I know that if they have any one problem, it's not from refusing to talk, it's from talking too much, okay? They like to, they like to tell everybody and um, they won't have any trouble telling Satan <clears throat> by allowing the Holy Spirit to do it. Mary from Tennessee, who was the priest in the Bible that had three daughters? They are that are across, that had crossed over the Caucasus Mountains, and later one of the daughters became the Queen of Europe. <clears throat> well, she became the Queen of Scotland. Her name was Scotta. But you're a little bit confused. The king, the the king, not priest, was Zacharias, and his daughters were taken by Jeremiah, and they were taken there to Europe, and uh, the traditions of Glastonbury bring this out pretty well, and one of them's name was Scotta, and from her name comes Scotland. So the seed line, king line, through the woman's seed continued on even into Europe and still does. The queen today, her number one duty is protector of Israel, is the protector of the word of God, okay? That, that's her number one duty. Uh, Vernon from Michigan, you stated that absent from the body is present with the Lord. Is this correct? Yes, it is. Where is this found in the Bible? Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 and 8. If someone has not accepted Jesus as their Savior, where do they go after death? They go to the wrong side of paradise. You can read uh, Luke chapter 16, where Christ gives the parable of Lazarus and the rich men. Lazarus, who served God, went to the right side of paradise, but the rich man who was evil went to the left, and, and he could not cross. They're in holding for the millennium age. Okay. And uh, so I listen every morning, think we're... Well, thank you. It's good to have you with us. Uh, Lenita from Ohio. I think that's Linda. Also, where can I find about all three world ages and heaven ages in one book? I've been trying to tell some friends about this, and I wasn't able to, to prove this in the Bible. Well, if you have a companion Bible, probably a great help to you would be Appendix 146. If you do not have a companion Bible, all you have to do is take 2 Peter chapter 3. It has all three earth ages and it has all three heaven ages. There are not three separate heavens and there are not three separate earths, but there are three separate ages and they run Naturally, the first heaven age is the same as the first earth age and, and, and so forth. But it's all brought out in that one chapter. And you know, wh where you want to begin to teach is look, look at Jeremiah chapter one, the first six verses, where God tells Jeremiah, I chose you before you entered the mother's womb. Well, where was he? He was with God. Well, how did he earn that? By being what he is, Jeremiah. God doesn't give things away for free. And then he said, while you were in the womb, I designated you as prophet. So, or, or you can take, um, at the same time, you can take uh, in the book of Malachi, or, or Romans 9, 
you can take Jacob and Esau, where God would say, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated while they were still embryos in their mother's womb. And how, are, how could God possibly hate a little old baby before it was ever born? Because of the soul he placed in it, in that child, from the first earth age. It's what he did there, he did here also. He cared nothing about his heritage, and so it was. A jury from Texas, why is there not going to be a rapture? Where do people get the idea that there is going to be a rapture? Well, the word rapture is not in the Bible, first off. But usually it's 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. But they fail to read 13 and 14, which sets the subject. The subject is, if you believe Christ rose from the dead, then you better believe those that are dead in him or sleep in him have risen also. So there, that's, there's no resurrection except at death. They raise and return to the Father from whence they came. But then it continues on. There's no way that we who are alive and remain can precede them. Why? They're already gone. You can't precede something that's already happened. They're gone. God does not allow them to lay out here in some hole in the ground. He brings them back home to himself in spiritual bodies in paradise awaiting that great time. Um, so the rapture came to be, and, and um, unfortunately, it can deceive people concerning the Antichrist if you're not careful. I'm out of time. Hey, I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. But most of all, God loves you for it. It's, it's the letter he has sent to you, telling you how to be pleasing to him, how to receive his blessings. And when you study that letter, it, it makes his day. And when you make his day, boy, is he going to make yours. You can count on it. We're, we are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, Again, bless God, he will always bless you. Most important though, you listen to me, listen good. You stay in his word every day. In his word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus Yeshua is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800 643